Meg and I were fully integrated into the lives of our extended families. It took some time, of course, but we really got to a place of full assimilation in both directions. Um, Peg's father, Bill, had heart surgery some years ago. And after the surgery, he was in one of those step-down units, you know, where there are like five guys in a room all together. And um, Peg had been in there a lot, you know, taking care of him. And she'd gotten to know kind of all the guys on the unit. And, um, her, and her, I have to say also that her family was a very sort of traditional Irish Catholic family. But they had really, they had really come to integrate and accept us, even though there were things they didn't understand. And this is one of my favorite examples of that. So, he, so Bill was there, and these other guys were there. And Peg said, um, she was going out to get something at the gift shop or something. And she said to one of the guys, she said, do you, you know, do you need anything? And he said, oh yeah, can you get me a newspaper? And she said, okay. And she walked out, and as she was walking out, she heard this guy yell to Peg's dad, Bill, you have a wonderful son. And <laughs> Bill, without hesitating, said, that's not my son, that's my daughter. She's a lesbian. <laughs> this full integration into our family was a source of great joy for us. But very often, friends, gay friends, would say to us, you're so lucky. You're so lucky that your, family, your families accept you. And of course, in some sense, we were. But I was also always very uncomfortable with this construction, because it seems to me that what underlies this statement is that somehow we're lucky if our parents don't reject us. Right? That acceptance is not something to be expected, but rather it's a stroke of good fortune. It's a bonus prize. It's like a trust fund. It's, it's a nice extra. It's, it's, a, it's like winning the lottery. But it shouldn't really be thought of in the same category as basic love. But shouldn't acceptance and incorporation of your gay child's life into your world just be a bottom line requirement of good parenting? And this really brings me to my second set of thoughts on this subject. I often say to young people whose families are still struggling with their coming out, I say, this is the thing, I bet, that will win your families over if they are people who are open and willing to change their attitudes. The thing that will win them over is your friends. And haven't we all heard that particular signal that this, the world of one of our straight relatives is being cracked open when they say to us, you have the most amazing friends. And it's the thing that makes so many families of gay people eventually find that their world is expanded, is made so much bigger, and is enriched by their gay children. It's the quality and texture and depth of these friendships, or more accurately, of the families that we have built outside of the traditional family structure. And so when we talk about marriage equality, I feel two things. I feel, as I have said, of course, of course. But I also feel that we as gay people know better than anyone else that family is more broadly defined than that. We know that there are many forms of commitment, many forms and many manifestations of love. We have the great gift as LGBT people of being different. We get to rewrite the whole script. Because we're excluded from the obvious path, we get the gift of conscious decision making. We get to choose how our relationships look. Marriage developed, to a large extent, as a form of organization for, to facilitate the care and raising of children and a structure to take care of elderly people, and sick people. And the world has really changed, and the economic imperatives around that have changed as well. And because of that, there's this flux. There's this room. We have choices now. Gay and straight people have choices now, but we have the same sets of concerns. How will children be cared for? How will elderly people be cared for? How will sick people be cared for? And we, as gay people, know as well as anyone else, probably better than anywhere else, that these roles are not always filled by people in traditional marriage arrangements. And I wonder, what is it that's in the state's interest? What form is it that's in the state's interest to protect and support? What is it that's in a religious organization's interest to protect and support? And I, I find myself asking the question, why is conjugality, or really the supposition of conjugality, 
whether it's between straight people or gay people, why is that the organizing principle? Just as I wonder, as many people do, why health insurance is tied to employment. You know, it's an old setup, and does it really, is it really the best way for us to be organizing ourselves? Cannot a case be made that people are family to each other when they are willing to make a commitment, driven by love, to care for children, to care for people who are ill, to care for the elderly? Should not people who make these commitments, in whatever form, receive the full recognition and support of the state and of their religious institutions? I think always, when I think of this topic, of my cousins, who are two women, sisters, who are now in their 50s, who spent their entire lives caring for their invalid mother. That was the choice they made. That was the primary commitment that they made. They did not marry. They did not leave home. They consciously committed themselves to caring for their mother. And when she died a few years ago from complications from her multiple sclerosis, they, who are both also ill and on disability incomes, did not receive any of the benefits a spouse would have received. And they've lost a great deal of their income since they don't qualify for her survivor's benefits. Their commitment is, in my opinion, undervalued and undersupported. I think about grandparents who raise their grandchildren. I think of friends, single people, gay and straight, who form committed friendships and households in which they care for each other over time. It was very striking to me when we were doing the wonderful ritual of talking about the ways in which we feel queer, that at my table there was more than one person who said, I feel, I feel queer because I'm single. I don't, it was very striking to me. Now, my partner, Peg, my former partner Peg's father died a few months ago. And she comes from a big Irish Catholic family, and her parents had moved to Virginia, and uh, you know, all her brothers and sisters were there, of course, with their spouses, with their children. And with Peg, there were four people. There were me. There was me, her ex-partner. There were two of the lesbian brothers, because we are family to each other. And there was her best friend, John Akamine. And John and Dominique from the brothers I'm telling you, moved heaven and earth to be at that funeral in Virginia. They came from um, LA. It took them, it was like they practically came by Pony Express. The connections they had to make, the amount of money they spent, but they were her family and they were there. And it was so striking to see all this, you know, biological family, all these traditional straight marriages, and then this group of four queer people who, there was no question, but they were there. Did we not, as gay people, spend the 80s watching friends and lovers care hands-on in the most intimate, wrenching, and committed ways for their dying friends and lovers? I remember particularly going to the funeral of my friend Billy's lover, Joe. His parents had not been around much when he was sick. They could not deal with the fact that he was gay. They couldn't deal with the fact that he had AIDS. But they insisted that he have a Catholic funeral in which the mourners were told that Joe had died of lung cancer, and Billy was told not to cry because no one there should know that Joe was loved by a man. That is clearly unacceptable to us. We all think, how can that be right? It is clearly not right that the person who loved Joe, who spent months watching him waste away, lifting him, feeding him, cleaning with his own hands Joe's vomit and his shit, loving him, loving him, it is not right that he was rendered invisible. We see clearly that this is a relationship, a commitment worthy of recognition, worthy of admiration and support. So my question is, do we not want a system that recognizes this level of commitment in whatever form it comes, whether it is between lovers or friends or cousins or grandparents and their grandchildren? Doesn't this level of commitment between people of any, in any relationship signal a profound form of love? Who has witnessed the way we have, what it is to love and commit at this level and to have this love and commitment rendered invisible, rendered less than?